April 8th, 2011. For those of you who didn't think we'd make it here, we did. The sun is shining in the North Country. We're on the Ridge Road in Champlain at, Champlain at Calvin's house. We've done a lot of programs at Calvin's house. It's like going to Grandma's house. You have to go through the fields and down the Ridge Road, and we're here. And we are so thrilled to meet a guy we've heard so much about. Ron Anstey, how are you? I'm just fine, thank you Delighted very much. Delighted to have you over here. I watched Calvin's video of your presentation at the Alice T. Minor Museum. Okay. You get around a little bit, don't you? I have done that a few times. You, you, uh, you're originally a Vermonter? Yes. Where do you live now? I live in St. Albans. That's not, that's not a, that's just a fur piece across the bridge. And of down course, there. just across the pond. But Calvin told me, and as he asked you after we walked in here this morning, uh, where you worked, and you worked at Wyeth. Yes, I did. For a long time. I worked at it when it was Airst Laboratories. For 32? 32 years. And then another? Another three and a half. And that's just about how long I worked on the radio here in Plattsburgh. Oh, you know. Started in 71. Did you really? Yep. I started about 10 years before that. Yep. So you had a, what did you do there? I was in uh, quality control. I was, a, I was a chemist. I worked primarily uh, for the first 25 years in the laboratories. And then I moved on to the management side and uh, uh, ran some quality uh, control departments, quality assurance departments for, for the various products that they made there. You know, we talk about boys and their toys. Yes. The only thing I could think of as I drove out of my driveway this morning was, look, in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's, it's wrong with his telescope. <laughs> this, uh, you know, I've always been thrilled to meet people like you who have an intense passion for any kind of a, a hobby. But for you, this is this has occupied at least ninety-two percent of your brain for a long time, hasn't it? Um, and you've well, loved astronomy think... since when? Since childhood? Uh, yes, I, I I've been at uh, astronomy uh, since I was a, a little boy. There were times when I was not very active uh, because of, you know, say, family and doing a lot of other things. That's what happens to hobbies sometimes. Yeah. You yeah, push it, them to one side. To um, I, I did bring with me. Um, I saw your little telescope. Right, that in you the other, in yes, the other yeah, I knew he was going to bring it out. Yeah, there it is. Uh, that's it, that did elicit a reaction from the group at Alice T. Minor. <laughs> oh, he's got a little tape on it. Yeah, well, it it's seen its better days, of course, but that's that's the first telescope. I can almost remember how much you paid for it. Three dollars and ninety-eight cents. Ninety-eight cents. <laughs> Three dollars and ninety-eight cents. But didn't we all do that as kids? Yes. Uh, this was my first telescope. It doubled and as a telescope, and uh, and when we played pirate ships. And when we played and pirates, and, and when we played anything else. Uh, and but the fascinating is. part to me, Ron, is the fact that you kept it all these years and protected it from terrible well, it's, disaster. Uh, it's probably just many thanks to my mother. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and my mother. Aren't mothers wonderful yes, for that uh, reason? She did save that, and uh, when it was no longer a, of, of interest to me at this at this size, it stayed, and she did keep that. So that's well, the only reason I still have it. You know, <laughs> I'm grateful sure. to my mother for many things. I'm uh, not too grateful that she saved all my report cards, however. <laughs> <laughs> but mothers have a way of putting those things in drawers. And my mother, because she, she wasn't too affluent, uh, at Christmas time and at birthday time would send me some of these artifacts from my childhood. That's, and uh, it was kind of neat. So those, I are of, great, those are great gifts. A lot of things that around, still there. around my house. Yeah that I enjoyed as a youngster and I was looking the other day at a at a little workbook I had in third grade. It was mm -hmm. interesting to see. Go back and look at that again. Yeah. Yes. So how did you start this this uh, passion for astronomy? Did you just, you liked what you saw up in the sky? And well, I, I, you know, certainly I went to school and I was in science. I was a chemist, so I was into science. And so science and the heavens and astronomy were just 
that for a hobby that's where I would gravitate to uh, because of uh, again uh, I was interested in science so that's what that's you know I think that that's what sort of got me going as opposed to uh, you know some other uh, some other hobby that I could have taken up woodworking you know, or yeah you know or something like that uh, some people most people I think have an incidental interest in astronomy because it's there. <laughs> it's there. Um, it's there. As long as you live in, in, in a place like this, you can look up. Uh, I did have a relative tell me once that there were no stars in their sky because they lived down in Rhode Island. But when they looked up, they didn't see any stars. You know, you and so they didn't have it. It wasn't a matter that they just couldn't see them. No, they didn't have any in their sky. And they were convinced that it was only up when they came up here for a visit that they could see stars. Isn't that great? No? Yeah, you can't stand in front of the Empire State Building right. and see Venus at any time of the year, right? I would think not. I, I haven't yeah, tried, but I would think not. It would be difficult. Well, you know, Calvin and I, we just did another program recently talking about this great area of the country we live in. Mm -hmm. And it's good for us in so many respects. And it's nice to live in a relatively small community. Yeah. But that's something people don't think about. Right. That the skies, especially in a beautiful sunny day like today, yeah. the skies are beautiful, and at night when the stars come out. Exactly, we you know we we do live in a fairly fairly dark area, uh, and so it it does make that hobby something that we can actually do here. So now, when you uh, were you a real student of the skies in high school? No. For example. No, I I I I, I was not. Uh, it was. All, all pretty much books, and but I, I really wasn't that active at that point. Uh, I had my little telescope, and I had bought another one by then. Uh, but again, it was nowhere near the type of instrument that that you need to do anything uh, of real interest. Uh, the little telescope, I mean, I'd be lucky if I see the craters on the moon, you know. And, but but uh, that's cool for the first time. Oh, I mean, but, but when was, you discover it, it yourself. Green cheese when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> but when, <laughs> when, you, when you put a telescope on the moon and you discover those craters are actually there, and, and again, there weren't that many pictures back then that we have today. We, haven't, we didn't put men on the moon back then. And uh, so the images that you saw were, wow. You know, there are a lot of people watching this very program who were, didn't have the pleasure as you and I did to watch that all unfold on television. Yes, we did see that. Mm -hmm. Have you ever wished you could make a trip like that? You ever wished I had the millions of dollars to make a trip <laughs> as some other uh, businessmen have done to the sky? Uh, probably not. Really? Uh, it's, You'd rather be a distant observer. I I, I like where I observe from. Uh, it, it, there there are certain risks associated oh, with that. How well that we I know. don't know if I could I could could take care of. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I feel exactly the same way. I mean, when you consider that that is like training lions. <laughs> I I like to watch other people do it. You know exactly, uh, and and the computers they had were so much less than what's sitting right in yeah. front of me right here. And they and they got there and they got back. And it's it's just phenomenal we're, what we they we, did with what they had. Yeah, and we're so lucky because as a small child I never would have dreamed that that I would be able to watch that in my lifetime. True. And how many other magnificent things have we seen since have we, we seen? were children? And I'm a lot older than you are, but you've talked about digital cameras and digital telescopes and computers and telescopes and none of that. When I was a little boy, it was, come on, get in the car, kids. We're going to the to the Hayden Planetarium yeah. in New York City. And that even as a tiny child, three or four years old, I would be in awe of Absolutely. the program. But then we'd come out and we'd burn broad daylight and my father told me years later and then you would start to cry because you couldn't you, you couldn't see it. justify that yeah oh okay but did you go to planetariums as a kid anywhere no um, we I was the pretty much in in my circle was the only one interested 
No kidding. Um, and uh, there was just no, we'll say, support uh, with other children or anything else. That uh, it's just something I did on, on pretty much on my own at that age. But now um, you, 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 uh, your son is a, is a, is a real n n astronomical nut like you are, isn't he? Huh? Yeah. Um, he, we did this when he was uh, fairly young, eight to years old or so. We did a lot of astronomy together. And uh, then, of course, obviously, as things progress, he moves on to other things. I move on to some other things. And it's he's the one that actually dragged me back into it. Oh, he did? Really? Yeah. I should have known. Yeah, he dragged me back into it when he called and said, hey, Dad, I just bought, I just bought a telescope for Christmas. Come on down. And bought a nice 11-inch telescope. Uh, that's 11-inch in diameter. Oh, oh boy. And so uh, we both got really back into it uh, pretty much full time, and that's when I re, re uh, introduced myself to the Vermont Astronomical Society, which is a group of us and uh, say about 75 like minded individuals uh, in Burlington area. Uh, they cover quite a fairly wide area, but it's, you know, I would say centered in Burlington, and we meet there and, uh, once a month at the Brownell Library in Essex Junction, uh, 7.30. We hold our meetings every non-holiday Monday, first non-holiday Monday of the of the month. Anybody's invited. Anybody, the public's invited to uh, any of the, the talks that we have or any of the meetings that we have. Yeah. Now, we have a planetarium, a small but nice planetarium here on the campus of SUNY Plattsburgh. Right. Have you ever met uh, Dr. Glenn Meyer? No, actually, I haven't. Uh, and... To, to be honest, I wasn't even really aware that uh, that it was there. No, come on. Really? Isn't that interesting? Well, no, your yeah, telescope I, I could look across the lake if it wanted to. But yeah, it yeah. wasn't even aware. Isn't that I, nice? Like, but I don't know if they have a companion society on this side of the lake or not. That's what I was getting to. I don't know. Yeah, I, you, I, you have people from this area who come over to join you? Um, we got to get something going. We got to get I don't those, think they those come hands over that across far. the border there. <laughs> I don't think they come across that far. Yeah. I don't know of members, pardon me, uh, that uh, that come over from the Plattsburgh area. I've uh, interviewed a few people and met a number of people who are backyard astronomers yeah. who have nice telescopes set in their backyard. And right. they normally invite me when it's 11 o'clock at night and 22 degrees below zero. <laughs> Gordy, guess what I got? <laughs> guess what I got? It's called hot coffee and a little blankie over me, and I'm not going out tonight. But these people uh, have shared with me some of their photographs. Mm. And... I, you know, I have a couple of them actually framed, you know, yeah. nice pictures of Jupiter and things and, right. you know. So, your society has, uh, how many people, you said, about about 50? seventy About 75. 75. About 75. Uh, it, it varies, and, and we are actually, I think, growing a little bit. Uh, are, are you fully retired from business? Or I am you, now. Yeah. You are. So, mm -hmm. you can... You can uh, Donate more time to this group and yes. to your passion. Yes, and that makes it really nice. It, it it does, and you know others have done this in the past. In other words, as they reach, they they have, as they've retired, they've volunteered their time in doing various things, uh, uh, various we'll say presentations to school groups or other groups that that ask yeah. us to come in. And now it's my turn. Well, we're going to show a lot of pictures. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but I just wanted to lay a little framework mm -hmm. about who you are, Ron, okay. and the fact that people have been looking into those skies, as the phrase goes, for time immemorial. I mean, we have evidence that our ancestors in the deepest, darkest prehistory times were not only fascinated by what happened up there, but it pretty much governed their lives, didn't it? Absolutely. Uh, uh, that's how they knew that things were going to change. They knew when certain patterns were in the skies meant that it was going to get cold. And when certain patterns were in the skies, things were going to get warm and it was time to plant crops. Yeah, they they, they lived and survived by knowing and, and being aware of what was around them. And I think that's probably one of the reasons they did survive. Isn't that amazing? It is. I mean, it, they, and that just, yeah, it's fascinating well, when you and, think about it. And there are published timelines about when the interest 
in the states of Vermont and northern New York began in astronomy, and of course we have no idea, except that Calvin and I recently did an, an interview about Samuel de Champlain, and we've done many, mm -hmm. but we showed a picture of an astrolabe, and then we showed an actual astrolabe, and that's what he was using, coming down the lake, right? Right. To and that's a long out, time ago. Figure out where... <laughs> Uh, and 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 to uh, to to help uh, you know determine where where he was, yeah. Well, it's never enough just to enjoy a hobby, as you do, and you're very passionate about it. Uh, it and when you get that knowledge, isn't it nice to share it with other people? I I watched your enthusiasm <laughs> on the video that Calvin did at the yeah. Alice T. Minor Museum in Shay and yeah. isn't it? It, it it's nice to be able to share your hobby yeah. with with others uh, maybe trigger some interest uh, or uh, it's it's really I've, I've, I've given the, that talk in various forms uh, it's evolved over uh, I started like in 2007 uh, with a with a first grade class oh no kidding yeah and isn't it beautiful when you think the and little they were, kids? And they were sitting there, and they all were looking at the pictures that I was showing and listening to what I was saying, and it was just, it was just, it was just, absolutely. And they they were they were all so enthused, and and I put one picture up on the screen, and it had a whole bunch of stars in it, and they were some of them were different colors. And one of the little kids raised his hand and says, "How come the stars are different colors?" And before I could get it out of my mouth. The child sitting next to him said that's because they're different temperatures. Come on. Out of the mouths of babes. And I go, wow. <laughs> that's like the little five-year-old that was on the news recently and wanted to be, he was crying in the car because he couldn't, he was too be, small to be the governor of, of New Jersey. <laughs> so, I, so that occupies about 15 minutes of news time for the next three weeks. So I, I just, yeah. how did he know that? <laughs> I didn't know that at that age, yeah, but he did. So you before know, I could answer it, he answered the question. There for are me. kids who get focused on things yeah. from the time they're very small. It's like many of my children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, who you when they're five, it's dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. They know every creature that ever walked the earth, how to spell it, <laughs> and what it looks like, and I didn't have a clue. Yeah, you know, and I couldn't spell it today. Yeah. <laughs> But there is a lot. There's a lot to learn, and before we do anything else, I just want to point out the fact that a person doesn't have to buy a fifty thousand dollar telescope to get started no, with this hobby. Absolutely not. You said binoculars. Yes. You know, and when you can afford, and you can uh, uh, interesting and, and sometimes fairly decent telescopes can be purchased. Uh, for not a for lot a, of money, for, for especially a, for used. a few hundred dollars. Yeah. Yes, and used. There are there are there are sites out there that sell used telescopes. Uh, a, a design called Dobsonian gives you a lot of bang for the buck. Uh, it's a very simple design, and you can get a lot of light gathering power for a few hundred dollars. That's wonderful. And now that we're in this digital age, we talked about you spent a lot of time, mm -hmm. you know, and how many of us with our 35 millimeter cameras were out there trying to take these pictures, trying to figure out what, how to do it. And now yeah. the, the digital camera age and the digital telescope age have right. opened up new vistas. Right. It's opened up the skies to people that uh, both sides don't have a lot of time to study it. Yeah. Uh, it does make it very convenient, uh, but you, as you, as you take these telescopes out and that they basically walk you through the sky, you start to learn a lot, and then you start to learn and you read and you start, you know, if if the interest is there, then there, then you go off and grab books and learn exactly where everything is, so that you know rather than let the telescope tell you. That's wonderful. Well, now that we've said all of those things, we're going to pause for just a moment and come back and show you some very exciting things in the sky. Mercury. Uh, we're talking with Ron Anstey, who is a, an amateur astronomer, but he's, he's so much more professional at it than I am that 
I'm just standing here with my mouth open most of the time. Because it's every day it's exciting, whether you're an amateur or a professional. Isn't it, Ron? Absolutely. Uh, and today there are a lot of amateur professional uh, collaborations because we have more time so we can let them use our computers to analyze some of the data that they've collected and then feed back the information to them all processed. Uh, sometimes the amateur can participate in uh, searches of certain parts of the sky that uh, the professional doesn't have enough time to look at and we send them information and sometimes uh, there are uh, the search for supernova and things like that there's so much data being collected by the professional that they don't have time to analyze it and they send it to a number of amateurs and the amateurs actually look at the data and there's just been recently a couple of supernova that have been in, uh, discovered by um, 14 year olds don't you love it? I love it. That's it's so exciting for me. Yep. When a when a youngster yep. can discover something and maybe even get his name on it. <laughs> yeah. Together with you know. Wow. Together with the professional, they took credit for the supernova a couple three years back uh, that the amateur discovered because they were analyzing the data that the professionals didn't have. You know, they they collect so much today that they didn't have a chance to look at it themselves. And so they parse it out, and there's those collaborations. It's wonderful. What have you seen that you don't think anybody else had seen before? Mm. Anything? Or anybody in your group? Uh, well, one of our, let's see, one of our members is uh, very active in uh, asteroid uh, oh, yeah. uh, uh, work, and <clears throat> one of our members did discover, I believe it was a, a supernova in conjunction with somebody else. No kidding. Yeah. That's great. Um, so there are some people that are, uh, we'll say, a lot more on the science side. I'm on, I'm on sort of the enjoyment side. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I don't think I've really seen anything or found anything that, that others have not we before all, me. <laughs> we all hear those those ads on the radio and on television about how you can get the star named after you if you pay. That's the only way it would ever happen in my lifetime if somebody paid the 45 bucks. Yeah. But anyway, you we were just talking uh, before we started the camera again, Ron, about, about Mercury and a very interesting project. So tell us from the beginning. All right. Well, in there's a project called Messenger. Uh, the satellite was launched in uh, 2004 and it headed towards Mercury and just recently in March they were able to uh, fire the retro rocket so that it is now in orbit around Mercury so that they can do a much more serious um, imaging of the uh, of the surface of, of, of Mercury so they and that's what again. that picture was that we showed at the beginning of the right. segment that is actually a picture of Mercury it, is not, it looks a lot like the moon but if you think about it, that's what you would expect. Mercury is a rocky planet. Uh, it got hit and bombarded by everything the moon got bombarded by in, in its formation. So it is cratered very much uh, like the moon. So I'm sure that they will find things and be able to evaluate things uh, from the data that they collect that will shed light on its formation and its its life and history. Before Calvin hit the on button a few minutes ago, you were describing for us, and we, we certainly are rank amateurs, how why it took so long to get there. So <laughs> to explain that in layman's terms, will you? Well, from, from what I understand and from what I've read, uh, that they needed to be to get the, the satellite up there, they needed to conserve fuel uh, as much as possible so that they could get the mission to Mercury and in doing so they ended up sending it out in 2004 and it went off in an orbit and it actually went flying by Venus it went flying by Mercury came back out around and then continued in a ever decreasing circle so that when they got finally in 
in uh, 2011, they were close enough to Mercury and slow enough that they could fire their retro rockets so that it would go in orbit. Otherwise, it would have taken a, a much bigger spacecraft and a lot more fuel to be able to stop it on its first pass through there. They just let gravity pull things around until it got into the right place. This and is science. This is science. Pushed right to the edge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Just to be able to figure out how to get there at the right time. Oh, I mean, just where is it going to be eleven years, uh, seven years from now? Yeah. And so on. But on, on top of, on, along with that, there's the Voyager 1 spacecraft, which we launched in 1977. Wow. Now, that is currently uh, about three times the distance from us as Pluto is. It's out, what? It's out three times the distance, and it's still working. They it's still working? It's still working. Wow. They sent it a signal just a little while ago to change its angle so it could measure what's called the solar winds and what, a, what the direction of the solar winds are coming from out at that distance. Now it's out at 16 and a half light hours from the sun. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go with right. light years and here light hours. Right. It's light hours, and a light hour is about uh, 11 million uh, 11 million miles, so it's it's out three times the distance to Pluto, and it's been out it's been traveling for 34 years, and for that to get to our nearest star other than the sun, the nearest, it's going to take 76,000 years. Space is awful big. <laughs> <laughs> I won't pack a lunch. <laughs> Space is awful big. Well, you know, we talk about our universe, and then we talk about others, don't we? Yes. And it, it, it does, it's easy to, to boggle your mind. Mm -hmm. So we can only bite, take a little chew <laughs> right. at a given time because it's, it's beyond. I mean, it, makes, it makes Star Wars look picayune by the time you get to it now, you know? Right. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? But distances in space are, can blow your mind. It's very difficult to get a, a concept of how large space really is. And when, then when you coordinate time and space, mm -hmm. we wonder how Mr. Einstein was able to come up with that formula in the first place, don't we? Uh, it's truly amazing. His, they, these his people, brain was wired a little differently than most. Than ours, yeah. yeah than most. But as you alluded to at the beginning of the program, science builds on itself. Yes. So you are able to predict certain things. But sometimes people just seem to have a phenomenal ability to project what they know far into the future. And I suppose that's why some of these uh, science fiction writers that we know and love were able to predict things that have actually come about in real science. True. Yeah. They were able to think and synthesize and be able to project what might be. Yeah. And they were, in some many cases, right. Yeah. So this Mercury thing is really a neat thing for you. Mm hmm And what what is it shown that we didn't know before? Anything? Um, I'm not. I don't think that all the data's been analyzed enough. They finally, you know, have, you know, just gotten there like uh, less than a month ago. Oh, no kidding. Right. This is yeah. this is this is these are new images. Uh, it's not that we haven't taken pictures of Mercury before, but it's on like a flyby. And so as as this graph went past Mercury to go somewhere else, it, uh, it took images. And even this spacecraft, when it went by Mercury um, on its two passes, so when it was sort of slowing down to, to get into orbit, uh, took images. But I don't think that they, they have analyzed the data enough. At least I haven't seen anything where there, there's a, oh, we've discovered this wonderful thing yet. But it, I'm sure it'll come. Well, you know, when, when we're going to these far off places, we're looking for water. Mm-hmm. We're looking for something that might be the building blocks of life somewhere else because I'm sure that ever since the first man looked into the sky, we've wondered, is somebody out there? Well, <laughs> do you have a, your own personal feeling about that? Well, there are hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Alone. Alone. Hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. 
and based on work from, we'll say, uh, astronomers prior to and including work from the Hubble, you can estimate that there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. Okay? So hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars. And on top of that, scientists have recently been able to detect other planets around stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. That's a fascinating topic all its own. But they've been able to detect other planets and they have been able to detect what they consider planets in the Goldilocks zone, where everything is just, just right. right. <laughs> the planet's uh, not too far from the sun, not too close, it's not too big, it's not too small. And so my feeling and my belief is that something has evolved elsewhere. I don't know what, but something has evolved somewhere else. It's the numbers just say that something should have should have happened. And and chances are that there are are places that are behind us and other places that are eons ahead of us. Very so, possible. Of course, finding life is one thing, and wouldn't that be good if we could find a little plant somewhere? <laughs> but to then we talk about intelligent life, and then we get into whole different philosophical right. discussions. Yeah, uh, and, and I, I don't, I don't know. But if the way you're describing it, we'd be very naive if we didn't think there could be something out there. There's got to be something out there. Yeah. I, I and. You know, the theory, one of the theories is that we picked up our water for our planet from the impact of comets and things like that. Well, that would have happened elsewhere. So if the planet was in the Goldilocks zone and everything was just right, maybe they were impacted by comets too and they got water. And once you have water, that's where things get started. Just in your lifetime and in my long lifetime, where there are uh, many theories that have developed about how this whole thing started. We talk about the Big Bang Theory, but then we get into other theories and as a scientist you can appreciate this so-called string theory and other things that just send my mind into orbit. <coughs> because and, 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 I'm just, my, and I'm right behind you. <laughs> I'm just too humble to be able to grasp it. Right. The fact that the fact that something that we're doing here could be happening a long ways away. <laughs> but, but but I'm interested in the theory of time, always have been. You know, and, and, and it doesn't take much of a scientist to realize that, that time is not necessarily a continuum except for our own convenience. Things happen, like I was reading that timeline of astronomy in Vermont from 1609 up to 2004, and then I guess somebody got tired of writing about it, but but, you know, that's in a timeline. And you're following this Mercury thing in a timeline. But time gets warped as you, get, as you go faster and faster, doesn't it? If you, <laughs> if you believe, uh, you know, if, if all the, the formulas hold up, that's what it predicts. Yeah. That's but, what it predicts. Well, what that means to the layman, Ron, is the fact that uh, <laughs> they're looking at this beautiful star. And lovers are holding hands and, and making wishes on the on the evening star, the first star, not realizing that that star, that light they're seeing, <laughs> somebody could have shut that light off a long, long time ago. The, the nearest star to our sun is 4.2 light years away. Dear God in And heaven. a light year is 6 trillion miles. <laughs> so 20, there you go. 24 now. trillion miles. In other words, the light from the nearest star took four years to get here. It took four years yeah. to get here. Now, that's the nearest one. And there are obviously many that are, I mean, our, gal our, our Milky Way galaxy is something like 100,000 light years across. 
So if you looked at a, another star, if, you, if it was bright enough and you could see it, it might have taken that light 100 years, 200 years, 500 years to get here. Yeah. When you look at galaxies in our, uh, with, through, the, through the telescope, these are hundreds of millions of light years. So it's hundreds of millions of years that light has been traveling before it got here. So you're right. It could be gone. <laughs> and, and chances and, are many of them are. Well, and they're certainly not in that position. They're not, they're not where you're looking at it any, you know, anymore. It's, it's somewhere else. It's, you know, this, this discussion will have people tearing their hair out before uh -huh. we're finished here today. Okay. But that's why it's interesting. Because, you know, uh, we, uh, we are taking those little bites, and we are learning a lot more as time goes on. And I think people like you deserve a, a medal pinned everywhere on their body <laughs> for trying to uh, get, get an interest going in the, in the young kids out there. And when you told me you went to first graders, mm -hmm. second graders, yeah. the kids you talked to, that's where you got to start. Yeah. you got to build that enthusiasm from the time they're small, and God knows what they can discover by the time they're our age. And, and, and I've been absolutely amazed at some of the questions I get and some of the answers I get from the students themselves. Those insightful young yes, brains. The insightful young brains, they do sit there with just, they, they, they just soak it all in. Uh, I, I say I've, I've been exceedingly well received uh, by the students that they have been very attentive. I've just enjoyed bringing this stuff to them because, they're, as I say, their questions are so thoughtful and some of the answers come from the students themselves. I think what that proves is the fact that this, you know, there are a lot of groups like yours that study a lot of different things and have different limited interests, but a lot of them are closed groups. You want your doors to be wide open. I know. We, and hope, we don't we want hold, to think that you know parties. something somebody else can't possibly know. You know, we, right? we hold we hold public star parties, where well, well tell me what that is. Well, like uh, every Friday in May, our club will be at the Ethan Allen Homestead in Burlington every fr every clear Friday night. In fact, even if it's cloudy, somebody will go to make sure that the sky doesn't open up for a few <laughs> minutes. Uh, yeah. uh, we and the public is invited, and our members bring their telescopes. And we invite the public to bring their own telescopes if they have one, uh, especially if they would like some help or would like, uh, you know, how, how best can I use it? We'd be more than happy to try to, to help them. And we point our, our uh, telescopes at the, at the sky and show the public what, what is out there. We do this in May and we do it in September. What I would suggest is that go to our website, vtastro.org, and look at our calendar to make sure we haven't changed locations. But sometimes we also hold them uh, for, say, libraries or other groups that ask to have a public star party. Sometimes we hold them at our observatory in Heinsberg. So our calendar will tell you when we're going to do this, and the public is, you know, will, will be invited, of course. And part of astronomy, though, doesn't have to be all the science part of it. Some of the joy is just going out and looking, taking that that telescope that you have, no matter what it is, and pointing it at the moon or, or Jupiter or Saturn, and just enjoying the view. To me, that's, that's, that's a good part you of know, it. You know, I just got an image in my mind, and I have a vivid imagination. Way back when, when we started putting satellites up, and you could see them mm -hmm. at times, and at, at camping, and we love to camp in the summertime, in these clear north, northern New York and Vermont skies, getting the whole campsite out in the field, laying on our backs, and people had driven by, they would have thought we had some kind of a weird thing going on. We're all wet watching for the satellites going over. Yeah. But yeah. I guess mankind has always been fascinated by the sky. Right. And from what you've told us today, it behooves us to, to pay more attention to what's going on up there, I think. Well, also in the next few years, the sunspot activity should be increasing. And, uh, the nor and the northern hit. lights should be coming back. Well, listen, we, we uh, no, no reason why you should listen to me. But I mean, we, we, I was hoping that we'd see better northern lights, aurora borealis, than we've ever seen here 
And we were all disappointed by, by the weather and other conditions in the last few weeks. Because those sunspots have been pretty crazy lately. Well, but, but not anywhere near the level of activity that uh, has, it's, again, it's in about an 11-year cycle. And we're, we're, down, we're down in the low spot. We're, we're on this, the part where it's coming back. Aha! Uh -huh. So in the next few years, I mean, keep your eyes out there to the north on the clear nights. Uh, they are increasing. Have you seen spectacular? Yes. I, I've seen some absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous colors, displays, and colors right from here, just like I'm sure you have also. But um, not for a while. Though. Oh no, we no, might, no. We've, we've been, been we've running been. outside when we were told we should should be able to see them on a given night, and of course the, there was so much cloud cover we couldn't see anything. Things have been in a in a in a in a, in a lull lately, because again it's it's a, there's a cycle to sunspot activity, so there's a. a, a uh, a cycle to northern light activity, and right now we're in the we're in a low spot, but in the next few years things should start to pick up. For people way up north, way oh. up north, get some spectacular views in Alaska, don't they? Yes, they do, and there there are, you know, again, the internet's a wonderful tool. There, you, you, there's a website out there that has a camera pointed at the sky. No kidding, all yeah. the time. All the time. Oh, isn't that neat? And you can watch the aurora that, from up there. Um, I don't exactly know the name, but again, if you go, if you use you Google and do a search, just noodle around and find it. Yeah. yeah, you you can find that website and the camera's pointing at the at the sky. When you say when you tell me that, I was just thinking of how many people don't look up. You know, they're so they've got the blinders on, as mm -hmm. my mother used to say. You've got the blinders on, yeah. and don't pay attention. But I can remember on Long Island, once when I lived there in the mid-50s, looking up one night, and the whole northern sky was brilliant red. And I looked at whoever was in the car with me at the time and said, you know, we got to stop the car because either this is the most fabulous thing we've ever seen or this is the end. <laughs> the end of the and world, we better, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we better say our prayers because we're all done. But every now and again you get a good one like that, don't yes. you? Yes, yeah. you do. And as I say, they do go in about 11-year cycles, and then there's uh -huh. another cycle on top of that one. That, uh, yeah. That and they talk about it, uh, um, about those sunspots affecting our uh, electronics devices, television signals, mm -hmm. telephone signals. But recently, recently it hasn't been a big problem up here anyway. Well, <coughs> we are protected. We've got a good magnetic shield around the, the earth. Yeah, but you talk you talk <laughs> about getting signals out to Mercury. <laughs> I that I mean we can't even get a good telephone signal at how many spots there was a cell phone signal here in, in Clinton County for goodness sake. And and when you send that signal out there it takes six minutes to get to the satellite and it takes six minutes back to find out that it actually got the signal. Yeah, it's it, so far away. It takes a little while just to get a signal to the moon mm -hmm. when we're trying to make the rover go, you know? Like, exactly, because of, because of the distance. And that's six minutes. It takes 16 and a half hours to get a signal to the Voyager 1 that's out there. <laughs> <laughs> Say turn left and hope that it happens. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm sure we've all used computers and, 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 you, and you, you hit the... You know, you, you hit the return button and nothing happens, and so you go, yeah. <laughs> Well, these people have to have patience. They hit the return button once to send the signal, and they have to wait 32 hours to find out whether they got it. Is it <laughs> got to go out, got to come back. That, that, there's, that's so fascinating. We're going to pause for a moment again yeah. and decide on another direction, and we're going to have a real good time. So don't go away, all you moon watchers. Okay. All right, let's talk about the International Space Station as uh, it's in the news every now and again. Although space doesn't occupy nearly as much news as, as other things on this planet do these days. So let's talk about it. Well, um, the, the thing is that it flies over, uh, overhead, in the early morning or in the evening and is very, very visible if you know where to look. And to find out where you need to look, there's a website called Heavens Above. I love it. <laughs> called Heavens Above. And you log in there and you register and put in, you basically you can pick from a, a menu they have uh, your location. In other words, they'll let you go to a map or they'll let you, you know, pick a city. And you can 
pick where you are, save that so every time you log in it knows where you are, yeah. and it will predict when the International Space Station will pass where you can see it. Isn't that wonderful? And it's a big, bright object, and it just it takes sometimes anywhere from five to seven minutes, depending on where it is in the sky, to go across. And it's just the kind of neat thing to, to, to observe. And we have two shuttle missions left, and there are times, if you watch this website, where the two of them will be chasing each other across the sky. Come on, really? Yes. No kidding. Well, because again, they're going to dock yeah. at the International Space Station, sure. so you see the International Space Station, then you see this other little bright object following. <laughs> and so there will be a, about two opportunities left uh, to make, actually observe that in the sky. That's kind of sad, isn't it, to yeah. me? To me, that's kind of sad. Because we had such great enthusiasm back in the early 60s as, mm -hmm. as time went on, and we thought we'd be a lot farther ahead than we are now. Right. But, but those are other circumstances. Those are other circumstances. <laughs> but it, it's still, it's, it's kind of a, a you know, a, a non-telescope. Uh, let's just go out and look at the sky, and, and you can, you can, and you go on to the International Space Station, and there is a, once you're there, you pick the ISS, and then, I don't know if you can capture this one. Sure, flip it around. It will show you a picture of the stars that are out at the time it goes by, and there will be a little line in there that actually shows you um, what the track of the International Space Station will be. In this particular case, it's right down here. And it's in the morning sky now, and on the 17th of April, it will start to come into the evening sky. This is about 8 o'clock, you know, if you go there uh, and get exactly the exact time, you'll see it coming in. And this is the track, and once you go out and locate those stars, uh, you can then figure out what track it's going to take, whether it's this way or whether it comes from low down there or, or back over this way. I can visualize people watching this show now who are going to jump right on that website because everybody's... Everybody's connected these days, yeah. and why not do it? And I bet you there are other other websites that you check in with every now and again. Absolutely. Now, you showed me a picture of the International Space Station going across the sun. Yes. A video. Right. Did you take the video? Yes, I did. Can we see it? Yes. Anyway. Let's stop for a minute. Yeah. About where the arrow is toward, if you look at it as a clock face, from about 3 o'clock to 11 o'clock, it takes 1.6 seconds to make that transition. Now let's find, are you running? Yeah. Okay, tell me tell me when, when you first noticed this and how you had to set up your camera to well, capture it. Again, I go, there's a website called Cal Sky that predicts these events and so I logged in and registered on that website and put my location in St. Albans, the coordinates of my location, and it sent me an alert about 10 days before. Oh, did it really? Yeah. Isn't that and cool? It said, the International Space Station will pass in front of the sun at your location on the 20th of March at 8, 11, 36 in the morning. <laughs> I think that's so neat. So on that morning, it happened to be clear. I went out, uh, set up all my equipment, and shot the video. I shot two minutes before it was supposed to happen and two minutes after. And out of 18,000 frames, it accomplished, it covers about 40 frames of the whole video. So I cut it down to one little clip, and that's the little International Space Station zipping across the moon, or the sun, excuse me. I'm easily impressed, but this really blows me away to be now, able to it's only happened. That. It's only happened three times at my location in about the last year, uh, because it's a fairly rare event. Again, the... Sh the International Space Station is very small. Uh, it's out about 200 to 400 miles from the Earth, and it just passes in front of the sun at your location once in a very rare event. And the pass is about, like, you could see it in about a, a, a strip about four miles wide. So if you were outside that zone, you wouldn't be able, it would miss the sun. Yeah. Really? So let me, <laughs> that's, that's but, just wonderful. What equipment did you use? How did you do it that day? Um, I did have, you plan ahead? Oh, yes. Uh, I planned ahead. I, mean, I have a what's called a solar telescope, which is for looking at the sun. You don't do it with a regular telescope because 
you will cause serious damage oh, to the yes, telescope. Oh, yeah. I have a very special telescope that you look at for looking at the sun, and I look at a single wavelength of light called hydrogen alpha, and I mounted my video camera on my telescope. I have a very small little video camera, hooked it into my computer, and when the appropriate time came, of course you're tracking the sun all the time with your oh, sure. your, your telescope mount, you're tracking it, because it will move right. Oh yeah. So you've got to be tracking the sun. And then uh, I turned on the video and let it capture it, and I saw it go zipping on by. How long, how much video did you have to shoot? I shot five minutes of video and captured 1.6 seconds of the shuttle, That's or the right. International Space Station. I love going. it. <laughs> But, but I want—I didn't want to miss it. I, I didn't want to be too late or, or, or too, you know. Did anybody else get it in your group? Well, it happened only at my house in St. Albans. It—it it would not have been at anyone else's oh, place. Oh, I see. In other words, they had to be at, at that location. It, it just so happens that five days before that, it was to happen at uh, one of our other uh, astronomers, amateur astronomers' houses in Heinsberg. And so I grabbed all my equipment, and I went down, and we set up that morning, and it was only 0.11 seconds, so which means it was only <laughs> going to it, it was only going to capture just a little tiny, corner, tiny corner, yeah. little tiny corner, and I pointed it the best I could, and we missed it because it went underneath the what we were looking at. So this may not be as good as ET on the bicycle, right? Right. <laughs> but it's pretty darn exciting. For but me, it's it's, uh, it, it, it's an interesting event, and is that something other people will be able to see at some other locations? For example, in a month or so, or whenever this program oh, is aired. Um, well, it, without the, the special telescope, you're yeah. you know you won't be able to. But there are people that that capture it, and, and they get much better images than than I've got here. Uh, I thought that's pretty neat. That that's that's almost like a target that people just that to go out and and do shoot. If you go on the internet again, the internet's a wonderful place and and go look. Some people have much better videos. They were a lot closer, and you can actually see the the uh, uh, the solar panels. Come on! And there's Are one. Are you of, kidding me? No. And there's one where they actually show the International Space Station and the shuttle is right behind it. Oh wow. They're going to require equipment that I would never have. Yeah, it's more than I have. Uh, yeah. But actually, I have a picture of that in here that I took off the Internet. Really? Yeah. Uh, we'll find it. Let's pause a minute. Yeah. Okay. yeah, Ron says, if you like that other one, you're going to love that. Look at that. Can you imagine somebody getting a shot that close, Ron? Yeah. I mean, they, oh. have, they have some absolutely fabulous equipment. And also very, you got to solve the tracking issue. I would say you had to solve it. We've talked about exactly. tracking before. Exactly you, have, wow. you, have to, you have to know exactly where it's going to be to get that shot. You know, we don't want to imply that you can't start small. And when you, that's why I love oh. that, I love that little show and tell when you dragged out your telescope at the beginning of your little lecture. Because you can't start small. You start by looking up into the sky and paying attention. Paying attention. You can read a couple of books. The internet get is a, so marvelous. You know, get a, a, a star finder like this. What is that? Tell, show that to that's people a, and tell them what it is. That's called a planisphere. And it, it has all the constellations on there. Uh, this is a, a little, just a bigger version of it. You can get these at your, probably your local uh, bookstore. Uh, I got this one in Burlington. And you rotate it to the time and day and month, and it'll show you what the sky is like. And you use this where you go out and you hold it up, and then you start to look for the bright stars. Oh, sure, why not? And then it helps you identify where the constellations are. What a good way to start. I mean, and these are, you know, like $10 or $20 or something like that. You start so off for 10 like or $20, you can start by a I'm learning where all the constellations are. You don't need a huge investment. Even a nice telescope for a few hundred dollars. And, well, and you buy used equipment sometime. Okay, Ron, what is that image? And tell me about this site. We've been talking about it off camera. This is really exciting. Um, this is an image of uh, Orion Nebula. 
Uh, it's a winter constellation, you know, Orion. It's got the, the three bright stars, which is called the belt, and then it's got the sword area in probably this part of the sky, the western part of the sky, southern, southwestern part of the sky. At this time of the year, it's, it's starting to set pretty early in the evening. But there are websites out there, and one called SLU, S-L-O-O-H dot com, has telescopes located in this particular case, uh, the Canary Islands, and in Chile. And they, for $50 a year, you can have access to their telescopes uh, for a full year. And you're allowed to make reservations or ask it to point the telescope at the target you want to look at. Uh, you can have five a week, five in a seven day period. And so every seven days you can have another five. That's amazing for and, 50 bucks. Right. For the image that I have here, I told them to look at M42 in well, the Orion Nebula, uh, in Orion, which is called the Orion Nebula. And you can actually then, while it's gathering the data, click and save that picture for yourself. Of course, anybody that's, any, any image that they're looking at, you can save for yourself. So you there. have lots? I have lots. <laughs> I would say you have lots. I have lots along with uh, the ones we take with our regular telescopes. But when it's cloudy and miserable and 20 degrees below zero, I can sit upstairs and go to this website. And if it's not cloudy there, uh, I can look at what they're looking at. And sometimes I can slip a reservation in because there was a slot that was open and ask it to look at uh, a particular object this I'd looked at. just proves you don't have to have much to get started in this exactly wonderful field of astronomy as long as you have a computer and access to the internet and can spare 50 bucks a year look at yeah and this goes back to a point that Calvin made a short time ago when the camera wasn't on and that is the fact that depending on where you are you're going to see a different sky and if you're in the southern hemisphere right. wow you know but, and because they have a telescope that's located in Chile you have access to that entire southern sky uh, without ever having to go there, without the huge expense of dragging all your equipment down below the equator, and they have a different sky down there. Uh, it, it's different because of uh, you know the curvature of the Earth uh, and the way we go around around the sun. We don't flip this way; we go this way. <laughs> so, so depending uh, on what astronomical phenomenon might be occurring on a given week or month you don't have to pack your suitcase and go there there's somebody looking at it and you can look at it through their eyes right and if you know what it is and where it is you could go to this particular site and tell it that you want to look at a specific object if there's a comet in the sky that you can't see you could tell it to go look at that comet or uh, any other object that's out there there are significant astronomical events that are happening on a fairly regular basis, and some of them are only happen, happen every 600 years or every 80 years or whatever. So it behooves a person uh, like you mm -hmm. to know when those are so you don't let it skip by you. And there are so many, sometimes it's hard to keep up on all of this yeah. stuff. So you pick an area of interest, something that you're interested in, and you follow that. Uh, mine is more like general. I just like to go out and observe. I like to go out and capture images of the various galaxies and I really enjoy the moon. I take my telescope in the summertime and I, I point it at the moon a lot and take a lot of images just of the moon because it's again it's, it is such a fascinating object. I want people who are watching this program regardless of their age to just think about how long their minds have thought about the moon and how many generations before us have focused on the moon because it's such a near object number one because it was had great mystery and a great aura back in the olden days how, how many how many songs have been written about the moon how many wonderful science fiction novels about 
have been written about spaceships going mm -hmm. to the moon, what we'd find there, and the funny little men. The, the little green men. And the little the... green men and the whole thing. And, <laughs> and then we went there. Yeah. And you would, have, you would have thought that that was a terrible anticlimax. And for me, it just opened another door. How about you? It opened another door. It uh, opened it another showed, window, actually. Yeah, right, another window. It, it showed that with some of the rocks that they brought back, that they're awfully similar to the rocks on the Earth. Yeah. And some of the things that they found on the moon that didn't appear to exist on the Earth, they subsequently found when they started to look for them here. Oh, yeah. We have them here. So chances are, again, one of the theories is it's actually a part of the Earth that got blasted off into Why space. Why not? All right. Why so, not? Why not? How about comets and asteroids and things like that? Are they hold some fascination for you? Um, comets, of course, are, are, are fairly common events, but you usually need a good telescope and a good star chart and access to up-to-date data to be able to see them. There's only been a few that have been, you know, naked eye visible. Hale-Bopp. Hale-Bopp being one of them. Uh, absolutely beautiful comet in 1977. Uh, the one before that. 97. Or 97, excuse me. 97, excuse me. I keep getting that. And then there was one uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, Holmes was in, the, was in the night sky. Nice little round comet. Uh, well, I can remember my mother talking about Halley's Comet, I guess, when she was a little girl. Mm -hmm. Did it come around again? Yeah. It came around in, uh, what's it, 86? Yeah. And I was really disappointed. As were many people. Yeah. <laughs> I was really disappointed. I, 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 got, I had a telescope at that time, and I went out, and I looked, and I said, is that it? <laughs> Peggy Lee's song, is that all there is? <laughs> <laughs> is that it? <laughs> Am I really seeing it? Uh, yeah, um, and you know, and, and I did. What was the name of the one that started with K? Uh, Kohotek? Yes, Kohotek. Very yeah. good, Ron. Yeah. Kohotek? Yeah. Yeah. And so there are, have been fairly few that have been really uh, visible in the night sky to, to anyone with, without... Uh, some sophisticated equipment. But those, those that, that did go by, Hale Bop was absolutely spectacular. Uh, those that missed it, I, I, that's too bad. <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever see another one. I mean, that's only been, I've only seen really three really bright comets go by in my lifetime. Well, there you go. Yeah. And, and how many meteorites do you think hit the Earth at any given day? People uh, have no idea. There is meteoric meteoric dust hitting us constantly all the time all the time every now and then a good sized one every now and again a good sized one makes it all the way down uh, but if you take a, a magnet and just go outside and run it in the dirt most of what you pick up is a little bit of meteorite Meteoric dust. Meteoric Every dust. Every now and again, you get a good, a good one. People in certain parts of the desert go out and find them and yep. make a make quite a few bucks after one of them yep. leaves baseball-sized chunks and yep. some a lot larger than that, of course. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, meteor crater in Arizona. Oh sure. Do you do you travel a lot? Except I know I know you travel on the internet, but do you travel a lot? In, in, no, I to follow I, this I, hobby. No, I, I don't. I, some people do. Yeah, some people do. As I say, one of our members just went to Puerto Rico and dragged his telescope. He had to be careful how the amount of equipment that he took, and it was 150 pounds of telescope equipment, and I think he said something about a change of clothes was all he was allowed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but he wanted the telescope equipment, so never that, mind, that took precedence. Never mind the underwear. you got to bring the scope with you. Oh, isn't that interesting? So. No, I, I, I don't travel too much with, with Michael. I do go down and visit my son, who is interested in astronomy also. Uh, but that's about the extent. You know, Calvin had some good points. We all, as I said, we all look at the sky through different eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was saying, you know, I, and we're all interested in, in the giant dwarfs and the black holes and the things that you can't see that have unbelievable power. But Calvin and you were talking about being able to see through the Milky Way. 
being able to see in, cer in certain skies where it may be less dense, but you can see farther. And who knows what's past that? Uh, yes, and the universe is expanding, and what is it expanding into? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Anybody knows. It's just continually expanding. And you brought up a point, are we actually looking at ourselves? Yeah, a mirror Calvin within said, a mirror yeah. within a mirror. I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's hard to even get your finger on this, to hold it in one spot to think about it for a very long time. Because uh, the distances are so great that maybe uh, because light bends and is curved by gravity, maybe... Uh, the shape of that galaxy that you see billions of light years away actually was the Milky Way in yeah. a different shape. I mean, you could go yeah. on and, you know. Oh, yeah, the, the fabric of the universe right. and, and how it's it bends. Just, it's, all, it's all just amazing and wonderful to think about it. Yeah. But you know you've opened up an awful lot of doors. There are so many things available. There's right. a pocket sky atlas, for example, right. that I mean, people I, I, can some, pick up at their friendly... Bookstore. Most of these can be, uh, this I think was bought in, in again, a, a local sure. Burlington bookstore. It's a sure. pocket atlas, which goes into a lot more detail than the planisphere I showed you uh, about objects that are in the sky at a particular time. Uh, but nobody says you have to know everything by nightfall today. You can no. start you can with just, one of these books and just go through and look at it. And you go look at it and then maybe find an object that uh, you might want to go look at and then just... Uh, either with even the simplest of telescopes will find some of these objects if you can point them in the right direction. And what a, uh, uh, what a fun family thing right. it is, right? To go yeah. out on a nice summer night and just stand there and, yeah. you know. And one of the other ones that I would, I would talk about, it's called, you know, this is a book called The Modern Moon. It comes out with what's called a Lunar 100 card, where there's 100 objects on the moon of, of, of certain geological significance, and we've named of, it, we've named them all by now, haven't well, we? Well, most of them, a lot uh, of them. But there's a lot. There's a hundred of geological features that, if you had your telescope, you could just start down the list and see how many of them you can find. Uh, to help you, you can get a. Again, this is a, something you probably can get from your local bookstore, or uh, again. This one specifically comes from Sky and Telescope, but there's a, a chart of the moon. Oh, look at that. That's with a lot, beautiful. With a lot more detail. Oh, yeah. That's and one side of the moon. And that's the only one we can see. But the, <laughs> nice, the nice thing is this chart folds up, so if you're looking in just one particular spot, you can have this, and then you can rotate it to the other spot, depending on where, what phase the moon is in. And with a small telescope and a chart like that, you can go out and... See what you can see. I was just thinking as you were talking, of course, my mind wanders a lot, about how much of our language is based on words that come from the moon, or learner, or, or, or lunar, or loony. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. That's what you know, they thought. You know, the moon caused people to go mad in, in earlier times. Well, you times. know, we still talk about the effects of uh, the gravitation. Mm -hmm. the, right? moon does, the, the moon does certainly affect... Uh, Things on Earth. And our tides and yeah. and so many other things are affected. There are a lot of forces at work, some of which we take for granted and others of which we pay attention to every now and again because something happens in the news. Yeah. Like the earthquakes and tsunamis on our own planet. Yeah, there <laughs> we, we talked to just recently there where we were going to have the, the, the largest moon because it was going to be at its closest location and what what an impact that might have had. And then we had the major earthquake in Japan. And that sort of takes your mind off that. And you, and you say, well, moon. but you say, well, was that because the moon was cold? Scientists say, no, that has no impact at all. But There are a lot of forces at work. Yeah. There are forces that are working on our bodies and our minds right now that, we're not, that the average yeah. person is not even aware of. Well, yeah, I mean, um, you're certainly not aware of, and even if you're trying to think of it you can't be aware of but, it. But gravity alone, do you often think about gravity and how, how it varies from planet to planet? I mean we've we watched the antics of the first guys that landed on the moon. Right. We've, yeah, I certainly don't 
spend a lot of time dwelling on that. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 all a factor in in, in this grand scheme of things. Well, because most people don't think of why we stick there when we get up and walk, and why why we don't float away. Well, I mean, right now the Earth is rotating. And we're yeah. rotating at 875 miles an hour. Think about it, folks. <laughs> we're rotating right now at 875 not, miles an hour. We're not crashing into each other. And we we're not to... flying off yeah. because gravity holds us down. And, you know, again, when it comes back to the Earth, the Earth is rotating around the sun at 66,000 miles an hour. And we don't go flying off into space because gravity holds us to the sun. You know, we're creatures of, we're, we're taught to... From the time we're small children, not to believe anything we can't see until we go to church, and then that's a whole different thing that we take on faith. But then you come to black holes, and you're not seeing much <laughs> in a black hole, but there are forces at work that you and I can't even imagine, right? Precisely, and one of the theories is that uh, all galaxies have a black hole in the center. Is that where everything is going to end up? In other words, we had the big expansion, you know, 14 billion years ago, which made the universe that we have today. Eventually, will everything get sucked back in and then have another big expansion again? We don't know. I, I can't get my head around that. Well, there's so many things to think about, and, yeah. I, and I don't mind thinking about them, but I don't pretend to have any answers, but not being a... A scientist, at least I can speculate and not worry about whether I'm right or wrong. Well, again, we come back to the, 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 the distances in space are so large. Well, the, the, the time frames for these to take place are so large that we certainly won't have to worry about them. But you, you made a great point earlier about the fact that young, a 14-year-old boy discovered something that nobody had ever seen before. It's a 14-year-old girl. Girl. Then. That's even better. <laughs> that's the 14-year-old 14 14-year-old 14 girl. That, that's even better. And the fact that amateurs like, like you can come up with something and make a contribution. Yep. To they, say, here's what I caught last night. Yeah, we, we can, we can con collaborate with uh, the, the scientific community. And, and actually make a contribution. Uh, many many people do that. Now you mentioned before the size of the telescope. You talked about an 11 inch. Yes. What's the biggest one you have? I I have, well, I have at my house a 14 inch, uh, which is a 14 inch. It's the size of the mirror inside the telescope. Uh, at my son's house, we just purchased a 16 inch. Oh boy! Telescope. Oh boy! You're getting there now. Yeah. And. Uh, it is all hooked up so that I can run it from my house. Come on. Through the, I through the internet. Known. Yeah. I'm going to get my cell phone going and mess you guys up on the way by your house. <laughs> now, come on. You can run it from your house? Yes. I can, I can actually send it a mission um, and the, with, with the software that's available today and the internet connections that are available today, I can give it a, a mission and, and it will go to the target that I want it to go to. It will collect data for the length of time I, I told it. It'll change the filters in front of the, the, the camera so that I can get the red, the green, the blue, uh, and the clear. And then the next morning I just go back on and download that data to my house and then I can start processing it. With your son's approval. <laughs> is it on his property? It is what on his property. What if he wants to do it? Well, you guys are going to have to collaborate. Well, we'll have, well yeah, we collaborate. <laughs> well, That's you know, wonderful. Isn't that great? You know, he, he is in, 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 the, in the part of his life where his young family takes up a lot of his time. So he loves astronomy. And so he has the telescope there. And I can send the missions and collect the data and send him the results. And he can participate. And, of course... You know, as I say, he, he does the heavy lifting. He has to uh, maintain the equipment, make sure everything's hooked up, make sure the power's out uh, onto the, the scope and, and, and to the computer. But uh, but you can't leave that out all night. You you take it out, and you leave it out there? It, we leave it out. In we, bad we weather? Cover it. Well, you, we have a big cover. It's called a 365-day cover. It's, again, specially made that protects that telescope. And, and of course, the computer is inside inside it doesn't have to be out I would be so worried in high winds and well if the if there's going to be a tornado in that area yes stuff does come in but wow. other than that it stays outside 
with a very good insurance policy. <laughs> so yeah, how, how, many com how many telescopes have you owned in your lifetime? A dozen? More? Uh, no. No. Probably six. About a half a dozen. But you always dream about... The bigger one. A bigger one. <laughs> but again, it's like any other hobby. You start out going fishing, you get a rod oh, yeah. and a reel, and you probably you pay a few dollars for it, and then you go buy a better rod and reel, and then pretty soon you buy a boat. And, then and that's another hole. <laughs> then you bring the boat home, and your wife says, what did you buy that? You didn't buy another telescope, Ron? Yeah, well, we've had that. We've had that <laughs> I didn't mean to open a can of worms, but I know how it is. Well, no, with it's, people it's, it's, who it's have a, old cars and, and yeah. cameras and telescopes, and you, you, you buy that old car and you start to fix it up, and oh, then, yeah. then you find another. I mean, it, it's it, you're right. You, you said it right in the beginning. Boys and their toys. Boys and their toys. Uh, and girls. And girls girl, too. And girls and their toys too. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful field. Uh, um, so 16, is that the biggest you're going to go? You promised me for you're not going to have another one? I, I don't think we're going to buy anything bigger than that. It, it How long have me. you had this one? Well, we got it in January and we had to send it back for some repair. Oh, no. But uh, And we expect it back sometime in, in May or June. Oh, so you don't have it now? I don't, we don't have it now. We had it for about a month and then... Uh, had to have something fixed on it, and uh, the guy is now taking care but of it. But it's going to be fabulous. It the, the the preliminary shots through it were oh boy, this is going to really? be great. Knock your socks off type stuff. Well, how again, many so how many better. other guys in the group have them that big? Um, well, our club uh, has an 18 inch telescope. Oh. That the club itself owns. We have a 14 inch telescope that we bring to star parties. Uh, and then, of course, we have the members scopes, and and typically you're going to carry a smaller scope to a to a uh, a star party because it's got to be transportable. My my 14 inch is certainly not transportable, and that 16 inch is just not going to go anywhere. <laughs> it's how got, heavy? It's got to stay. How heavy is it? Uh, the, the telescope alone is about 75 pounds, but the mount that supports it and the pier that supports that, uh, we're talking hundreds of pounds. <laughs> oh boy. So. Well, we want to, before we finish this thing, we want to show people uh, a little bit about the telescope you brought here today. Can we do that? Absolutely. All right, let's pause for a minute. Yep. You ready? Okay, we're looking at a five inch telescope. Yeah. And what are you going to do, Ron? Well, this is a, a, a let's say, a telescope. It's called the, the folded design. It's a Markov Cassegrain. The light comes in here, bounces off a mirror, comes back off the central obstruction here and then goes back out through the eyepiece and comes up through here. And this is a commercial telescope. Uh, it's made by Mead and it's called an ETX. Uh, and the nice thing is of course it has the first it has a computer all built into it and I'm going to just tell it to align. It's going to get the time. Enter. It's going to get the time and date, daylight savings time. And I'm going to put an automatic line and I'm going to tell it to go. So it's going to find level all by itself. Look at this. It's going to just go off on, on its own. R2D2 would be proud. R2D2, yes. Yeah. And again, it's computer controlled, and so that if you wanted to look for an object, once it gets itself all aligned with the stars, uh, you'll go through a process. Um, and you just type it in the keypad what you want to look at and then it will go and point at it. And it should be close enough to the eyepiece that you will actually see the object. It's moving subtly now. Yeah, it, it's, it's, gonna, make, it's, it's making lunch. It's, <laughs> it's finding north. It will go and find north for you. And it'll, it'll also go and find its tilt so it makes sure that it's, it's level. So if you go outdoors and set this up at night and just turn it on, um, and of course that's there, there's a there's a whole school of, of amateur astronomers that don't like these. They figure you need to know where everything is yourself and go find it oh, for sure. yourself. But then there's uh, a group of us that really like the computer end of the, the the astronomy part, which makes it a little more fascinating for us. And okay, still finding level. But, as I say, it takes care of itself. Well, with a 5-inch telescope, mm -hmm. 
You could see a lot. Yes, uh, and again, the, the size of the mirror or the size of the objective lens uh, has to do with how much light you can gather. And the more light you can gather... Um, it's going after my belly, I yeah. knew it would. It's down the biggest star. It's <laughs> about the biggest star. The biggest uh, one, yeah. And so 5-inch telescope will give you um, almost the entire uh, uh, Messier catalog, 40, 110 different objects that you can actually find in the sky, lots of galaxies, lots of globular clusters, nebula. Uh, now, through a telescope, a lot of these things look like little fuzzy uh, little fuzzy cotton balls. The pictures you get are because we, we gather light for five minutes, ten minutes, hours, and you get these nice images. Now this is, okay, it's now wants me to point to the brightest star in a lineup, but of course because I can't see the stars, I'm just going to say, yep, you're there. And it aligns on the first star, and then it'll go find a second star. Ah. It'll go find a second star for you. And then once it knows where two stars are, it can then calculate where everything else is in the sky. It's like knowing two points on a map. If you know two points, then you can, if you can know where Shay Z is and you know where Ellenberg is, you can find where Plattsburgh is. Now this telescope doesn't actually capture images. No, it, it would have to have, you could put a camera on here. You could use it to capture images. You could put a camera, but this is usually primarily for, for visual observing. Yeah. So, okay, so it found another star, and I'm going to say, yes, that was where it was. If you needed to, you could adjust it a little. You'd look through the eyepiece and center it perfectly uh -huh. in, in, the, uh, in the eyepiece, but because I can't see anything. And now if I said, uh, for tour, let's go to mode, and let's tell it to go find something. And then if I then object, oops, I push enter, and if I wanted to go find uh, at, uh, gonna find something here. I'll just point it at. Gives you a little hand controller. Sure. Tells you. There we go. Enter. Let's say total to go. And tell us to go look at the M42 that I uh, said to go look at. This is where it would go and point the telescope at it. And then you would look through the eyepiece and hopefully you can see it. Now, uh, so this can't get, this telescope can't transmit signals even though it has a computer. Can't transmit signals to your computer, right? Um, well, you can set it up so that it does. Really? Yes. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yeah, you can set it up so you can control everything from your computer. And you can use planetarium software to then pick an object to go look at it and it will drive the telescope. So there's just, you know, for those who love computers and those who love gadgets, there's this would now be looking at the object that we wanted to go to go look at. We would look through the eyepiece, and then we'd focus it down here, and hopefully we'd be right dead center in the, in the object. You know, this whole so thing is a little... You know, it's so absolutely fascinating to me. I, I have looked so much forward to meeting you, Ron, and to hearing about your, your passion, because it is a passion. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's like any other hobby, it becomes a passion, and that's what's fun. Mm -hmm. And as long as it doesn't break the bank or ruin a marriage or, or whatever. But you're, you have, do you have a cross-section of, of uh, men and women in your, in your group? Yes, certainly. Uh, we have uh, a cross-section of uh, ages, from uh, children right through uh, retirees like myself. Uh, and we have certainly men and women in the club. Uh, many of them taking active parts in the various activities that we partake in. And, you know, it, you know just, just kind of give you an idea. If, if you wanted to go and buy something like this, um, I think they sell new for about $650, but you can always find them used probably for two, three, four hundred dollars no, 
No kidding. With all the features that this has. That's amazing. So, you know, it doesn't have to break the bank. Who's got a birthday coming up? Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that's absolutely wonderful. Now, this is the Vermont Astronomical Society. Yeah. VAS.org. Dot org. Yeah. Uh, and you're a Ron Anston. A N S T E Y. T E Y Anstey. Right. And you're you're listed on that site. Yes. Along with other board members, right? Yes, I'm on the board. I'm on the board of directors of that site currently. But well, just stop in on a what the first Monday. St uh, stop in at the uh, the first non-holiday Monday, uh, at the Brownell Library in Essex Junction, at 7:30. We hold a regular meeting. Um, our website is vtastro.org. If you just go to Google and go Vermont Astronomy, you're going to find us. Uh, look at our calendar. Maybe we'll have a topic that you're interested in. Every month, someone makes some kind of a presentation uh, on, on astronomy and various parts of astronomy, sometimes the history of astronomy, some about observing, sometimes about uh, you know observatories or different kinds of telescopes. You know, they'll bring show and tell, uh, and then uh, look at our calendar and maybe join us for a, a, a an observing session. That would be wonderful. These parties sound yep. like a terrific idea. I must confess my ignorance. I don't know if there is a northern New York group like yours on this side of the lake. I haven't found one. So if they want to start one, I'm sure you'd be love to give them a few tips. <laughs> They could certainly contact uh, our club president, and uh, we would work with anybody, uh, or contact me directly, and I'll I'll point them in the right direction. Ron, thanks so much for coming across the lake to join us today. Thank you. We can't. We'll follow you. We share. We'll follow you on the internet, and we'll share this with people all around the world because we think it's a it's a great thing. All right. Thank you. And. I thank you personally, and I know Calvin does on behalf of Hometown Cable for all your suggestions. This was a this was a good one. I mean, this was a really titillating and exciting for me to learn, because you have all these questions. You know, you, my mind bubbles over. Ron's an amateur, he says, and I'm a rank amateur, <laughs> but I'm always interested in in learning new things, and I've I've got myself a liberal education today. And I promise to study some of those maps so that I can act like I know what I'm talking about when I point to things in the sky. We didn't cover astrology. That's a whole different ballgame. That's right? a different you know, all together. That's, a, that's a time for another, that's another subject and for another person. This is the location where all your generous checks should come if you want to help to support this program to keep it on the air. And that's the Ridge Road in Champlain and Hometown Cable. And who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner.